So yeah, go ahead, Timo. We can slowly get started. And for those of you that are already attending, uh, thank you for coming today. And uh, if you haven't already, please sign up for the mailing list and details will follow in the chat in a little bit. So Timo, are you good? I'm good, yes. All right, Timo is good. It's going to be great. And so we're very excited to have Timo de Wolf uh, give a talk on certificates of non-negativity and applications in theoretical science. So thank you very much, Timo. Take it away. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And thanks to everybody for coming. Actually, I'm, I'm really humbled about this invitation. And it's uh, very, very nice to speak here. Um, yeah, we agreed before I start with the talk, I want to make two quick commercials very briefly. And um, there will be two links in the chat later. So the first thing is that we're organizing um, a conference on real and algebraic and convex geometry end of July. And um, all it will, I mean, almost surely be virtual. Um, all information is on the website. And we would be very glad to see many of you attending in TU Braunschweig, I should say. Uh, and the second thing is that currently um, joined with my colleague Dirk Lorenz, who is an applied analyst, um, we are hiring a PhD student in um, machine learning and uh, for a joint project with the physicists here in TU Braunschweig. So if you're interested, um, please feel free to reach out to me. But um, so now actually I want to talk about uh, certificates of non-negativity and uh, the applications in theoretical computer science. And um, so basically this talk has two parts. Um, the first part is a general introductory part, uh, which uh, with I will start now. And then in the second part this is about two uh, more recent results joined with Mareike Dressler and Adam Kopisch. But uh, the first part is basically assuming that, I mean, you have a general background, maybe you have not worked about non-negativity polynomial optimization. So I want to talk you, to you a little bit about like what this is and then specifically what we are doing in our group. And let's actually start with uh, motivating the problem from the perspective of uh, optimization. So the general problem that we want to look at is called a constrained polynomial optimization problem. You can see my mouse, right? Um, yeah, okay, awesome. So it's called a constrained polynomial optimization problem. The goal here is that we want to minimize a polynomial F that's a real multivariate polynomial, such that a collection of polynomial constraints, polynomial inequalities are satisfied, which are also real multivariate polynomials. If you start to think about this problem a little bit, the first thing that you realize is that it is a non-convex optimization problem. So if you have never done any optimization, maybe uh, the best takeaway here is really just to say that this is not so good news. So generally speaking, convex optimization problems are the problems that we like, that uh, we can, we have a bunch of um, effective methods to attack and to solve. For convex optimization problems, as you would think about convexity, there is a, there's only one minimizer, global minimum, uh, and all these things are not true for non-convex optimization problems in general. So it's much harder to attack problems like this. On the other hand, this type of problem, these polynomial optimization problems, have really a large list of possible applications. Um, here is, here is a little collection, like chemical reaction networks, computer vision. So you recently learned about this in Rekha's talk, I think, um, in control theory, economics, and then theoretical computer science, as we will talk about later, are a few examples of these applications. And um, so the combination of these two things says like, okay, maybe, um, let me actually start a timer so that I'm nowhere I'm roughly. So um, uh, these, these two com uh, combination of these two facts says like, okay, maybe, maybe we should uh, try to look at this problem from another angle. And the point here, of course, is that we have polynomials involved. So maybe algebra can help us out. As uh, so a first step, um, let's reformulate our problem a little bit and um, saying that instead of solving this thing up here, I want to look for a maximal constant gamma that I can subtract from my polynomial f such that f of x minus gamma is non-negative for all points which are contained in a particular set g plus. And the set G plus is a semi-algebraic set, which is given by my polynomial constraints. So it's really, it's just the same problem as before reformulated. But if you look at this from this perspective, you see actually it's an algebraic problem, really, right? It's, it's asking about non-negativity after subtracting a constant, non-negativity of a particular polynomial on semi-algebraic sets. 
And um, these sorts of problems, these non-negativity problems are not a type of problem that were only motivated from uh, the perspective of optimization. And, but in fact, they are old problems uh, coming from 19th century and were really uh, key problems in real algebraic geometry, talking about non-negativity of multivariate real polynomials. Um, of course, just reformulating the problem does not make it easy. So uh, it's relatively straightforward to show that the problem is NP-hard, uh, even for relatively small instances, uh, uh, you, you run into this issue. So what we should maybe do as a first step then is to say, actually, it is not realistic that we will solve these problems exactly in general. And therefore, the idea is to say, let's instead try to approximate good solutions in the optimization side, or let's certify non-negativity for certain classes. And uh, for this, we need to come up with an idea of what is a certificate of non-negativity that is useful in the context that we have. So let me be a little bit hand wavy here, but essentially we want three things. So uh, we want, of course, something that implies non-negativity, some condition on the polynomial that implies non-negativity. It should be easier than deciding non-negativity itself or, or uh, than ap approximating solutions using these certificates. And it should be satisfied for somewhat many polynomials, right? If I come up with a, with, with a condition that is completely artificial, then it's not of any use in practice. So I want something that combines these three things. Um, there is a standard example for this. And the standard example, uh, probably many of you have seen or heard about already is uh, something that is called sums of squares. So if I have a polynomial, and it admits a decomposition as a sum of other polynomials which are squared, then certainly this means immediately that I'm not negative, right? Um, and a second part here in terms of like following my idea of certificates is there is the following fact. I mean, it turns out that a polynomial is a sum of squares if and only if a particular corresponding semi-definite optimization problem is feasible. So, Maybe, again, you have never done anything about optimization. You don't know what this is. But then the main takeaway here is only that semi-definite optimization problems are a well-known and studied class in optimization. They're a generalization of linear optimization problems. But in particular, they are convex optimization problems. Yeah? And if remember from the beginning, convex optimization problems, generally speaking, are the kind of problems that we like, that, that, that are more accessible than the non-convex ones. So easier to check or easier to certify might be satisfied for sums of squares. Leaves the third question open about like how many uh, non-negative polynomials in fact have the property that they admit such a decomposition. And for this, um, I, I always do this when talking about these, these matters. Uh, let me uh, introduce some notation and uh, let, me, let me try to be a little bit more explicit. So uh, first of all, if we look at general polynomials, that's not so good because um, we would have to work in an infinite dimensional vector space. So, so let's artificially restrict ourselves to at most n many variables and at most degree d polynomials. Then we are in a finite dimensional space, that's easier. And then we can look at all polynomials that are non-negative in this space. And it turns out geometrically, um, these things form a cone, a convex cone, non-polyhedral but convex cone. And we can do the same with the sums of squares. And they also form a convex non-polyhedral cone, sigma n2d. This is called, uh, contained in the cone p n2d. So geometrically, something like this, right? Two convex cones and a finite dimensional re real vector space of polynomials. And uh, certainly, all the sums of squares are contained in the bigger cone. Um, and the question is, like, how much do they differ? And it turns out, this was my question before, right? How much do they differ? Uh, it turns out that this is not a new question um, that was posed or motivated by, by optimization. In fact, uh, it's a 19th century question that was investigated, well, was brought up in uh, work by Minkowski, and then it was uh, investigated by Hilbert a lot and by others. But uh, in particular, Hilbert proved in 1888 the following very seminal result saying that these two cones are equal only in three distinguished special cases. Uh, if you have univariate polynomials, degree two polynomials, and then there is this other special case. So it's an existential statement. And in all other cases, you have strict inequality. Um, here is an example of a polynomial that is non-negative, but not a sum of squares. Uh, it's actually 
polynomies. Motskin polynomy is the first example in the literature that you can find. Um, so you see it's like barely beyond this, uh, these special Hilbert cases, two variables degree six. And the polynomial itself looks pretty innocent, uh, just has four terms, it's very sparse. But one can show, I mean, with, let's say, reasonable effort that this is non-negative, but not a small squares. Um, let me quickly make another historical note um, coming back from this Hilbert result. So uh, given the fact that there are non-negative polynomials, which are not a sum of squares of other polynomials, Hilbert asked, and that was in fact Hilbert's 17th problem, whether at least every non-negative polynomial can be represented as a sum of squares of rational functions. And that is true. Um, Artin proved this in 1927. And let me quickly mention here that basically in this context or a little bit before also um, the Artin Shire theory about real ordered fields was developed and there sums of squares also play a distinguished role. So it's not only just that sums of squares are a natural certificate because it's like, yeah, okay, it's easy to do it, but also from an algebraic point of view, really uh, they, they have a special role and um, are, are not just an arbitrary example. Uh, one last historical note, um, not so historical, in fact, uh, more recent is um, a result by Bleckermann from 2006. So Greg Bleckermann, a uh, member of our community, many of you certainly know him from Georgia Tech. So he proved 15 years ago uh, the following, roughly speaking, the following results. So you might think um, that given like these results that I just presented to you, that uh, there are not so many non-negative polynomials which are not sums of squares. It's like hard to find some, and, and you could say, okay, maybe there are just like certain special cases and they are like the hard ones to compute and the other ones are like all sums of squares and they're more easy. But at least asymptotically, that's not true. That's, that's what Greg's theorem says. So he, he says, if you fix the degree of these two cones and the degree is at least four, and then you let n go to infinity and you compare the two cones in a reasonable way, let's, let's admit all details, then in the limit, almost every non-negative polynomial is not a sum of squares. And uh, so for this is uh, one, or well, was one motivation for us uh, to um, do our works about certificates about non-negativity, which I will tell you about in a moment. So let me just quickly recap. So this picture again, this is what we have, right? I mean, we have these two convex cones. Sum of square cone is contained in a non-negativity cone, except for the special cases by Hilbert, where red cone and uh, big cone are equal. The two cones always have the same dimension and it actually touches the boundary, so that also makes sense. And otherwise it's strict containment as in the picture. So we said, okay, if there actually exist non-negative polynomials, which are not sums of squares, then it would be nice to look at other certificates of non-negativity and maybe make them also so to some use in terms of polynomial optimization, of course, but, but also theoretically say, right? I mean, as uh, uh, we know that sums of squares cannot cover everything due to Hilbert's result and then maybe having Greg's result in mind. And uh, now, of course, if you if you want to come up with such a certificate, you 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 still need to satisfy these three things that I that I mentioned in the beginning, right? If you want to follow this this idea, so um, that was kind of the key motivation for um, Sadiq Ibiman and myself when we started to uh, work on well, developing this a couple of years ago, and then later, I mean. It, it worked out and there's uh, so this class of circuit polynomials, which are kind of the core, which I will uh, present in a moment. And then a bunch of results followed with different co-authors and some other people also did some work on it. So let me first define these central objects here, which are our certificates of non-negativity. And it's a little bit technical. So let me first show it to you and then I will, we will jointly go through it. A circuit polynomial is a particular type of very sparse polynomial. Okay, so um, first of all, recognize it has, like here, it has n variables, it has r plus two many terms, it looks like this, and it satisfies three properties. So let me first show you the properties and then um, let's see what it means. It's these three properties. So first property says, let's look at the Newton polytope of this thing. The Newton polytope is the convex hull of all the exponent vectors. We have r plus two many terms, so there are r plus two many points. Let's take the convex hull. And then the assumption is, or the requirement is that the convex hull of this thing forms an R-dimensional simplex. In fact, I want that there are these R plus one many vertices, alpha zero up to alpha R, which are the first R plus one many terms. And then there is one other distinguished term, which has exponent beta. 
which is not a vertex. And in fact, the second condition says what it is. It says it should be a point which is in the strict interior of the simplex. And here is a fancy way of writing this. You will on the next slide we'll clear why. I'm, what I'm just saying on, on, in condition number two is this distinguished term in terms of the convex hull of the Newton polytope should be a point in the strict interior. And the way I'm writing it here is to say, let me write beta in the barycentric coordinates of the vertices alpha. There's a unique way of doing it because the alphas form a simplex, they're affinely independent. And then all the lambda i's are strictly positive and this means beta is an interior. Okay, and then there is condition number three, and that's a general condition for non-negativity. If you want to be, not, you have a chance to be non-negative on the entire R to the N, you need that the vertices of the Newton polytope just have even entries and the corresponding coefficients are positive, always. Okay, that's, a, that's just an exercise. So um, this, this should be uh, our, our building blocks for our certificates. Um, we call this circuit polynomials because the support set is a circuit. It's a minimally affine dependent set. And if you think about like, okay, this is abstract, what could be an example, then uh, here, here's an easy example, right? The Motzkin polynomial, you already saw this before, non-negative, but not a sum of squares. And if you compare everything here carefully, you see, in fact, Newton polytope is a two simplex. It has like this one distinguished term, which is negative, the term is an interior and everything else works out. So why would you consider this class of polynomials? You consider it because it's very easy to decide uh, non-negativity. Before yeah. you keep going, uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, ah, what okay, is meant yes. by a sparse polynomial? Okay, a sparse uh, poly yes. Okay, yeah, thanks for the question, actually. So a sparse polynomial here means just that if I look at, for example, the total degree that I would have or the dimension of my vector space of polynomials, then I, I use significantly fewer terms. Most of the terms actually are not there, right? I mean, we could have... Um, uh, the degree actually is not um, here. I'm not even talking about the bounded degree, but you could use it arbitrarily high. You have n many variables, so you could have way more terms if, if uh, let's say, all the um, yeah, if if you consider uh, the finite dimensional vector space. And here we just want to use R plus two. Okay. So the reason uh, to consider this class is that it's very easy to decide non-negativity. Turns out all that you need is uh, one invariant. This is this number uh, we call the circuit number in our first degree. And first recognize, before, before talking about what it does, recognize it's very easy to compute. So it just depends on the coefficients that you have when your polynomial is given to you and on these barycentric coordinates that we saw on the previous slide. That's the reason why I wrote it, the condition in this way. And this, you get them by solving a system of linear equations, okay? So, so this means you, you, you get this number by solving a system of linear equations. And then it turns out that if you have such a circuit polynomial, then it is non-negative if and only if uh, you do the following. You, com you compute this number, and then you compare this number with the absolute value of the coefficient of your, of your distinguished term. And if the absolute value of this coefficient is smaller or equal than this special number, then you're non-negative. And that's an if and only if. Up to being a sum of monomial squares, which is a very special case that is obvious from the beginning on if you're in it. So deciding non-negativity is easy because you just need to compute this number. That's basically the upshot of this theory. Um, let me quickly give uh, some credit, uh, in particular to Bruce Resnick, who's also like a very uh, senior member of our community, and I'm sure many of uh, you know him. And Bruce had done, uh, 25 years before us, he had uh, done work on, well, I mean, it's a, a class of polynomials that he calls Aggie forms. And simplicial Aggie forms are a special case of circuit polynomials. And for simplicial Aggie forms, he showed the same result. Um, and in fact, um, many, many more things in, in, uh, this, uh, in this paper, uh, which maybe at the time, because it was really before polynomial optimization really uh, became a thing, uh, was not seen so much, but it is an amazing paper that he wrote there. And uh, there's, there's uh, various results, I mean, especially from our perspective, looking back in it. Um, another special case was shown by Fidalgo and Hovacic um, in 2011, a little bit before us, when you have scaled standard simplices, these turn out to be always sums of squares, which in fact our uh, polynomials are not. And we will come to this on the next slide. So now if you want to use these uh, building blocks, let's say these class of polynomials to turn them 
into a certificate of non-negativity, you do the same thing as before. Now let's consider sums of polynomials, like uh, arbitrary polynomials in n variables of degree at most 2D. And we are asking, does it admit such a polynomial f? Does it admit a decomposition as a sum of non-negative circuit polynomials? So I want to write f as a sum of non-negative circuit polynomials as defined on the previous slide. If I would know that, certainly I would be non-negative because all these GIs are non-negative. So we can write the set of all polynomials which admit such a decomposition, and let's call this sums of non-negative circuit polynomials or songs. And as it turns out, um, you maybe already guessed it, if you think about non-negativity and uh, sums of squares, this set is not just a set. Geometrically, it's a convex cone, again, non-polyhedral, and important uh, point to make here is that it is contained in the SOS cone if and only if you are in one of the Hilbert cases. So it's really, it's independent. So there are, I mean, you have already seen the Mutzkin polynomial, it's not a sum of squares, right? In general, they, they can be sum of squares, but in general, they are not, these polynomials, and vice versa. So like, uh, the, not, not all sums of squares are circuit polynomials. And the, uh, so this was first done by Zadig and me, and then this bound was improved by Mareike in her, Dressler in her thesis. Final question, uh, as before for sums of squares, are there many of these polynomials or is it just artificial? And uh, the good answer is there are many in the sense that the cone that you get here always has the same dimension as the non-negativity cone and the SOS cone. So we can extend our picture from before and the new picture looks like this. There's a new cone which entered uh, the field. That's our song cone. It's also a convex cone. It's contained obviously in a non-negativity cone by construction. It has the same dimension as the red and uh, and uh, well, turquoise or blue blue cone. And uh, generally speaking, the SOS cone and this green song cone in, they intersect, but they are not contained in each other except for these special Hilbert cases. So that's essentially now uh, the the playing field for us, and we want to use these certificates to well, I mean, show non-negativity, do polynomial optimization, etc. Um, let me make quick, two quick remarks before we move on in the direction of uh, our applications. And so number one is there is a lot to, to say about effective optimization approaches using these uh, songs. Um, also, there is some independent work done by uh, Venkat Chandrasekharan, who probably also a lot of you know because he's an active member of our community at Caltech, and collaborators. And they introduced something called SAGE certificates uh, a little bit after our first paper. And nowadays we know song is equal to SAGE, to put it as a phrase. Uh, so, and they have done a lot, especially from the optimization part. So there's a lot to say, not part of this talk, but feel free to ask me afterwards if you're interested. Second part is there's also a lot to say about relation of songs to, on the one hand, algebraic geometry, in particular to a discriminants, and also to combinatorics. Uh, again, not really part of this talk, but uh, if you're interested in that, let's chat afterwards about it. Um, what I want to do now is I want to come to these applications uh, in theoretical computer science. And for that, we need to go back to polynomial optimization. Uh, in fact, we need something that's called a hierarchy of lower bounds. So let me let me tell you what this is. Let's remember our problem that we had in the beginning, and let's start with the unconstrained case. Okay. So in the unconstrained case, I just want to minimize one polynomial on R to R, R to the n, no constraints attached. And uh, so this means, uh, in terms of non-negativity, I'm looking for a maximum constant to subtract such that I'm non-negative non on the entire R to the n. And then we said, well, I mean, this is the bound I care about, but the problem is hard. I cannot solve it or I cannot hope to solve it. So instead, I want to use a certificate, for example, sums of squares. And then if I wanted to use sums of squares from an optimization point of view, I would say, yeah, um, now I'm looking for the maximum constant to subtract such that this polynomial f of x minus a constant admits an SOS decomposition. And then you might say, okay, this is like theoretical. What do you do in practice? Well, I would use a semi-definite uh, optimization problem and a suitable solver to compute what to solve the corresponding problem, right? Uh, which exists, which I told you earlier. And um, now you can say, well, what if I don't use SOS? Can I still use this approach? And uh, the, the idea is, well, yes, essentially, it's not, that's not limited to sums of squares. Let's say I had any other class of non-negativity certificate, SONC or anything else that you like, then I could morally do the same, right? I could say like, okay, I'm subtracting a maximum constant such that my polynomial minus the constant is contained in this 
class of polynomials, however it looks like. And then I would hope that there exists another convex optimization problem that somewhat allows me to compute this lower bound. Whatever is the right convex optimization problem, but that would be the approach. But uh, now we could say like, okay, let's go to practice. And in practice, it's a little bit more complicated because most practical polynomial optimization problems have constraints. Okay, so now our suitable uh, or, or feasible region is not the entire R to the N anymore, but a semi-algebraic set. And we, have, we are back to our original problem, the general one, right? I need to find the maximum constant to be non-negative on the semi-algebraic set G plus. Okay, let's say I, I'm trying copy pasting everything from the previous slide and I wanna do the same as before. Then uh, let's say I'm using sums of squares again. And if I was just copy paste and put everything in here, I would get this, right? I would hope to get a lower bound by saying, well, I wanna subtract a maximal constant to be SOS, but then I would say to be SOS for all X and G plus. And that's bad because uh, I cannot quantify over the points in a semi-algebraic set to be a sum of squares. It's an algebraic property of a polynomial. It does not care about certain points. So it doesn't work, okay? And again, it doesn't matter whether it's sums of squares or another certificate. So there's, there's a general problem. So I, we need another approach to solve this. And the approach is to use something that's called a Positivsternsatz, okay? Um, let me give you the general idea of a Positivsternsatz without going too much into details. A positive stance, so there's an entire zoo of positive stance that's in real algebraic geometry, okay? But, uh, but they, they, morally, they always look of a, in a certain way. So you have your polynomial F and you assume you're strictly positive, in most cases, you wanna uh, assume this, on, on your set G plus. And maybe you have some other strings attached to G or G plus, which we don't wanna talk about. Then a positive stance that would guarantee you that there exists a certain algebraic way to express your f, okay? It says you can write your s as a sum of certain products of certain polynomials, where basically you have two ingredients. The one ingredients are polynomial capital GI, which are somewhat, depending on the, on the, on the theorem, constructed out of your constrained polynomials G. And then you have some polynomials SI, which belong to some certificate of non-negativity of your choice, like sums of squares, for example, right? I mean, it could, could be something more general, but I mean, normally in, in, in the first uh, ones that you learn is always sums of squares, of course. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the moral statement. And if you had this, you see, like, let's say you knew, like uh, for, for whatever reason, that your polynomial F admits such a representation then you would see immediately that you're non-negative on G plus because the GIs are somewhat constructed out of polynomials GI and G, which are all non-negative on G plus. So these guys are non-negative on G plus and the SIs are non-negative everywhere. So this, this expression here is non-negative on G plus for sure. So finding such a thing, or let's say subtract a constant and finding such a thing is a certificate of the type you want with the correct quantification. Um, but there's, there's a caveat. And uh, the, the mean thing here is that if I would construct a representation of my F in this way, I have to use these SIs and GIs of a particular type. So it could happen uh, before, uh, like if I, if I just construct it in this way, there could term cancellation happen, right? In particular, there could term cancellation happen of terms which can have an arbitrarily higher total degree than your polynomial F. So even if you just know that such a representation exists, you have no idea about what is the total degree that you need to admit for the SIs and GIs a priori. So what do you do in practice? Well, you still play the game and you artificially uh, put an upper bound on the total degree that you allow for these SIs and GIs. This will give you a lower bound to your problem. And then you can step-by-step -step increase this bound or let's say that the bound on the, on the total degree, which will give you a better and better lower bound for your actual problem. And then there are uh, statements would say like, well, I mean, if, if such a decomposition exists, th th this, this uh, hierarchy of lower bound should converge to the true bound that you're looking for. So, and this is uh, the general takeaway. And then of course, there are uh, 
um, this leads to different hierarchies depending on which certificates you use and which kind of GIs, etc. So for today, we want to use two, the two standard hierarchies that are out there, which I want to call uh, being of Putina and of Schmidtgen type. Putina type means that you do the easiest thing with a GI you can think about. You just take your, your uh, normal constraint polynomials GI and, and nothing else. And uh, in the Schmidtgen type positive stands, that's a, you have more complicated types of GIs. In fact, you use something that's called the pre prime generated by these small GIs. So you take sums of products of powers of these uh, GIs, and then this, this CI here is a non negative real number that you can multiply with it. So it's how it exactly looks like is not so important. Important takeaway is just. Positive stands that's a work in general, like the way I just described them. And then it leads to different types of hierarchies. And I will refer to these two types, Putina type and Schmidtgen type in the follow and, and or in a remaining talk. Okay. That's the general approach. And actually, this is the end of part one. And uh, as we said, so maybe that's a good point uh, for everyone in the audience to ask questions if there are any before we go a little bit more into the details. Great. So if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A um, and Timo can, I'll read it off and Timo can answer. Mm -hmm. Maybe what people think about if they have questions, I could ask a question. Some people have some time to type. Uh, is there also a, a Blackerman type of result for a song in the sense that if you're that this, this cone gets like small if you, this yeah. number of variables turns to infinity um, or something like that? Yeah, that's a, I don't know. That's a, that's a, actually a question that has been around since quite a while um, now. And um, I've been thinking about this a little bit and a few other people have too, I think. Um, but we don't have a proper result. I mean, there's, there's some ideas, um, maybe, maybe for some special cases to show something. Um, in fact, the question here even is a little bit more general because um, in an so in an SOS decomposition, the support set of the polynomial is not preserved. You can you will get new terms that you did not have before, and that doesn't happen in song, and it doesn't happen in non-negativity. So you can even uh, more ask the question in a more general way than you could do it before. But we don't have hard results. So if you have any thoughts, I, I would be very excited to, <laughs> no, I have no uh, about, about ideas uh, to discuss. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it definitely sounds like an interesting question. Yeah. yeah. So Zvi Rosen has a question for you, Timo. Uh, yeah. Could you restate how the Moskin polynomial works as a circuit polynomial? Oh, sure. Uh, let's actually, let's just go back. And that's a nice question. Um, so let's see, OK? Um, Let's take the definition and let's look at this. So definition says we need to have, we need to first find out what is the dimension of the Newton polytope, right? Um, here it turns out we have two variables and the Newton polytope, the convex hull of this thing is full dimensional. So it's of dimension two. It's a, it's a, it's triangle, right? I mean, it has, it is a triangle and it has three vertices, namely four, two, two, four, and zero, zero. Okay. Uh, so R is two, N is two. And uh, this property here is satisfied. It is a uh, two simplex, okay? Newton polytope is a two simplex. And um, then there is, uh, it's also satisfied uh, in the sense that, or the, the definition is satisfied in this sense that there is one more term, which is not a vertex, which is uh, this term here, this with a negative coefficient. Now the second condition says that the exponent, the 0.22 should be contained in the strict interior of uh, the simplex or the Newton polytope. And that's true. In fact, it's the Berry center of the simplex if you look at it uh, very carefully. So like all the lambda i's in this case are uh, a third, like one over three. And in particular, are strictly positive. And then this last technical condition you see are, okay, like all entries of the vertices are just even, right? It's just fours, twos, and zeros. And the coefficients are all just ones. So they are also positive, so it's satisfied. And in fact, what you can do maybe as a, as a little, um, like to try this out yourself, you could say like, what's, is, the, is this polynomial non-negative? Can, can we pr quickly prove that it's non-negative? Like in, in one minute, a Motzkin polynomial being non-negative, right? So we can, let's look at the circuit number. And if you, we just said already, the barycentric coordinates are all uh, one divided by three. So if you put this in here and you, and the, the, the BJs are all one, right? 
So uh, you get something like three times three times three, and then you take this third square root out of it. So it's uh, three, right? And now the condition says you should compare this, or it's actually, I mean, yeah, so it's three, and you should compare the coefficient of the distinguished term in absolute value with the circuit number. And the coefficient is minus three. So in fact, this inequality is satisfied with equality, which tells you that you're non-negative and this polynomial is on the boundary of the non-negativity cone. So it has zeros. Um, yeah. And it's, so it's sunk, uh, it's non-negative and uh, it has zeros. Okay. That was a beautiful half minute proof. <laughs> <laughs> More questions or should we go on? Okay, good. Let's go back. Um, oh, that was too far. Sorry. Here. Yeah, so I want to talk about uh, two more recent results. Uh, one is again joined with Mareike Fresler, whom I mentioned earlier, and uh, with Adam Kopisch, whom I mentioned in the beginning, who's a theoretical computer scientist at ETH Zurich. And then there, and so this is, uh, this first paper is going to be in the Journal of FOCM and then second paper was in Isaka two years ago. So it's about polynomial optimization on the Boolean hypercube. Okay, so it's a little bit, um, it's the optimization, po polynomial optimization on the Boolean hypercube is a special case of uh, the general constraint polynomial optimization. It's everything is as before, only I have one more condition and the condition is that I only allow uh, vectors with zero one entries, okay? And um, then the feasible region is, is are the vertices of an hypercube. Um, so there are two to the n many, many uh, feasible points um, that uh, up to additional constraints, well, maximally two to the n many uh, of these points. And uh, we call this the n-dimensional constraint Boolean hypercube. Um, first note, so this is not, maybe not completely obvious, but it's not uh, hard to show that this is still uh, in the class of constrained polynomial optimization problems. So this additional condition here is a polynomial uh, equality condition that you can write, I mean, with two inequalities here like this. So, so it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's in, the, in our general class. And let me also mention that it's, it's not super important that we have the zero one hypercube here. We can use minus one one or some others. That's not so important. Um, why would you look at this class, right? Um, the reason to look at this class or a good motivation is that there are a lot of important examples that, uh, of problems that can be phrased in this way. So in particular, there are key problems in, from computer science or in particular theoretical computer science that fall in this class. Let me show you one. A very famous example is the max cut problem. You have a finite graph uh, given. And the idea of this problem is that you want to co to color the vertices of this graph. And then you want to do it in a way so you can arbitrarily color every vertex as a, let's say blue, blue or red. But you want to do it in a way such that you maximize the number of edges which have vertices with different colors. And the idea is then kind of to say, well, I mean, you have like this subset S and its complement, which are uh, coding the color and you, you cut the edges, which uh, like connect uh, vertices with different color. And you want to do it in a way such that you cut as many edges as possible. That's why you call it max cut. Um, it turns out that this problem is a BC prop problem and it's not hard to write it down if you, if you know how to do it basically. Uh, so here's the idea, we can just do it together. So we, we look at the plus minus one Boolean hypercube where the dimension is the number of vertices. And we say, um, uh, we, we define the set S to say like, okay, depending on which value our variable XI takes. Well, if it's one or minus one that decides whether you are blue or red. And then you say, uh, I will want to solve, solving max cut is actually solving uh, this BC prop uh, problem. Uh, the constraint is just the Boolean hypercube constraint for the plus minus one Boolean hypercube. So there's nothing else to add. And then you want to maximize this uh, little polynomial here. And if you look at it, so you sum over all uh, edges basically, or all IJs and the edges. And then you see that here a term contributes with a plus one 
if and only if you have an edge which is connecting vertices of different colors in terms of the setting. So it's really, um, this problem is, is the same as MaxCut. MaxCut is, um, if you have not heard this before, uh, is a really a famous problem in, in computer science. In fact, it's, an, it's a known to be an NP-complete problem. It's on CARP's list of the famous NP-complete problems in, in computer science. Uh, so um, many, many people <laughs> care about in, 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 in this context. Um, so now what we want to do is essentially we want to look at different hierarchies and apply them to these kind of problems. And with the underlying idea that uh, we care from the perspective of um, complexity statements for algorithms or for solving these kind of problems. So I'll make this more explicit in a moment. But first, I need to introduce one more hierarchy. It's called the Sherali Adams hierarchy. Um, Technicalities, again, are not so important, but this is a particular hierarchy of certificates of non-negativity only on the Boolean uh, hypercube problems uh, that was proposed in the 90s. Um, essentially, the idea to use certificates as something, uh, sorts of functions which are called non-negative dihuntas. So that's, uh, if you put this into the language of algebra, essentially you look at multilinear polynomials where you restrict every term to have at most D out of N possible variables where D is should meant to be strictly smaller than N. And uh, so these are kind of the certificates that you allow. You can look for them using uh, linear programs um, which is of course very good, right? I mean, these are very easy convex optimization problems, but uh, it comes with a price. And the price is that if you have a fixed degree uh, that you allow for your certificate, then you, with Gerali Adams, you can never be better than SOS. That's known. And it's an important hierarchy that is used in this context. So we also want to take this into account. And for us, when we started to do this, um, so like actually at some point, Adam reached out to, uh, to us and said like, okay, um, I have seen your song certificate. So I was wondering whether something can be done for these kind of problems, uh, for these Boolean hypercube problems. And the motivation is that on the one hand, it is known that particular on the Boolean hypercube that SOS is exceptionally strong for these problems. It's on the one hand known. And on the other hand, it is known that there are certain special instances which are hard for SOS. And so here was the question, like, how does Song fit into this picture, if at all? But there was basically a, um, an additional uh, obstacle to take before we could do this, because it is known for SOS and also for Sharadi Adams, that if you have such a BC prop problem, then there is an additional property that is satisfied. Namely, if you can find a certificate at all for these type of problems, then there is an upper bound known for the, for the degree uh, that the certificate uh, can have. So in other words, if you admit a, a certificate at all using sums of squares for Boolean hypercube optimization, you know that you will find a, a certificate of degree at most 2n plus 2d, where d here is the uh, degree of the additional constraints. Right? Of course, n might be very large, but I mean, there is an upper bound. So this means if you want to say something meaningful in the context of uh, uh, polynomial optimization and let's say song or anything like this for these type of problems, you need such a uh, type of statement. Uh, otherwise, it's not interesting for the for the people and applications. And the first result that we proved in this first paper, joined with uh, Mareike and other, was to say, like, in, in fact, this obstacle uh, is taken out of the way, and Song admits uh, an analog statement. If there is an upper bound at all, or a degree uh, bound at, or, uh, yeah, if there is a certificate at all, then there exists a certificate of degree at most n plus d. Okay. So now, in further work, we really wanted to compare the hierarchies. And here, um, let me again motivate this a little bit from the perspective of uh, computer science. So the people there in people like Adam care about complexity bounds for, for important algorithms like MaxCut. And it turns out if they translate this into BCPOP, it, it corresponds to degree bounds for certificates um, that they can find or that we can find. The feature that we can use is that we have freedom in the terms of the proof system that we use. So this means we can use different certificates of non-negativity. We can use Schmidtgen hierarchy, Putina hierarchy, et cetera. Any positive standards that we like, that's all on us. And the question is how do these hierarchies compare in terms of, well, 
complexity slash degree bounds. In particular, is there a way to beat SOS on the Boolean hypercube? Because as we already said, they are known to be very, very strong. And um, of course, we need to have a proper framework for this comparison. The framework is to say, well, if we have two different proof systems, we want to compare them. We want to say one is contained in the other. If everything, roughly saying, everything that can be certifi certified in the first uh, system can be certified in the other as well. And can be certified, of course, this can be made explicit. Uh, we don't want to say like exactly with the same degree. This is a little bit too narrow. Uh, for, for a complexity point of view, this is too narrow. So we want to say that one uh, proof system is contained in the other. If, if I have a degree D certificate with, uh, let's say, the, the weaker system, uh, then I should admit a big O of D certificate uh, in the bigger system. So I can, I can be a little bit worse, but only up to a constant. Using this, we can now start to do a comparison. And do, now you might say, well, okay, do people actually really care about these certificates? And let me give you one brief example that was kind of a little bit out of my comfort zone, but this was an example handed to me by Adam. Uh, so there is uh, some work done by Ragavendra and Steurer. Actually, you might have seen them. They're occasionally visiting our community. So uh, working, for example, together with Pablo Parillo and other people from MIT. Um, and they have uh, looked at the following problem. So it was believed for a long time that Shirali Adams is strictly contained in the SOS uh, system over the 0-1 hypercube, but there was no example known. And uh, they have shown that this was true. This was So FOX, if you don't know, is a big computer science uh, conference. And they have shown this via connecting this to certain problems in something that's called the unique games conjecture. Maybe you have not heard about this in math, but that's a problem in computer science that a lot of people care about. So maybe as a little bit of a background. But now uh, let me use the final minutes and come to our results. So there are two parts and then we will be done. Part number one, and let me again just tell you in a nutshell what it says. So um, part number one is to say every meaningful proof system that you can look at for problems on the Boolean hypercube. And meaningful means it admits such an upper bound, like SOS and Charlie Adams and, and, and what we have shown for Song as well, right? If there exists a certificate, there exists a certificate of degree at most something. Every meaningful proof system that you can come up with is at least as strong as Charlie Adams in terms of this comparison. Charlie Adams is like the lower bound of what you can do in, in Schmidtgen type hierarchy. That's, that's the message. And then maybe I just state the theorem or like show it to you to tell you there is a theorem and not read through this because it's a little bit technical. But essentially, uh, really what, what this theorem here says is just what I'm, what I'm describing. Charlie Adams is the lower bound of meaningful things that you can do on the Boolean hierarchy. Okay, so let's move on and let's ask ourselves, what about the other certificates and how does it compare? So first of all, you can say, what, how does it look like for the general uh, CPOP systems if we do this comparison of degree there? And um, essentially, we could uh, just use earlier results and let's say reformulate and extend it a little bit and show, first of all, SONC and SOS are polynomially incomparable in general. So this means, depending on the problem that you can have, you might do arbitrarily better using an SOS certificate than SONC or vice versa. It depends on your problem. You cannot say it in general. Similarly, there is another type of certificate that we also uh, looked at. It's called SD source that was introduced by Ahmadi and Majumda around the same time as we introduced songs, which is kind of a both SOS and song if you want. So I mean, although they introduced differently, and uh, that is strictly contained in song. So that also using here some er uh, earlier results by Chandra Sekaran and collaborators. That's a general system. So now you might say, okay, great. We have Boolean hypercube problems. We know SOS is great. So maybe we can show something like this, right? And it turns out, no, we can't. In fact, it is it breaks down as bad as it could. Uh, what we can show here is on the Boolean hypercube, in Schmidtgen-like hierarchy, Song, Shirali Adams, and SD source are all polynomially equivalent. And in Putina-like hierarchy, Song and SD source are polynomially contained in Charlie Adams. Remember, Charlie Adams is even the lower bound of meaningful things that you can do, right? 
in general, let me say this again. In general, this is a this is a useful approach because really you can do arbitrarily better than SOS. But on the Boolean hypercube, no, you cannot. It's uh, it's it's as it, it's not better than Shardy Adams, in fact. And as is as DSOS, as normally it is strictly contained in there, but on the Boolean hypercube, it all becomes the same. And all this stuff is strictly contained in SOS. SOS is really exceptional on the Boolean hypercube in terms of this language. This is basically, in a nutshell, the result. Here's the full result uh, in uh, two diagrams. The left-hand side is the general situation. The right-hand side is the Boolean hypercube. Green uh, results are ours. Red results were known before. Um, dotted arrows are diagram chasing. And then <laughs> you can see the different sorts of certificates. And with star is uh, Schmidtgen-like hierarchy. Without star is Putina-like hierarchy. And then, I mean, yeah, double arrow means strictly contains, etc. And uh, this is it. So thanks a lot for your attention. Great. Thank you, Timo. Very nice talk. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, put them in the Q&A. And after the official Q&A, we'll have an informal discussion. And people can uh, uh, then turn on their cameras if they want to stick around and chat. Uh, so yeah. At the moment, if you don't want to type something up, feel free to raise your hand and, uh, and I can unmute you or Kathleen can uh, unmute you and you can shout out your question politely. Uh, so a question from Kisan Lee, Timo. Uh, can you briefly mention how circuit polynomials are related to A discriminants? Sure. Uh, let me go back. And so the, the short answer is, um, it's really, um, if, or yeah, so I, I think the shortest answer is to say, if you, if you look up in Gay van Kapran of Zelewinski, the definition of a discriminants, then you will find out, okay, in general, I mean, so, okay, but let me, let me briefly say what this is like for everyone, maybe, uh, two, three sentences. So you look at a space of complex polynomials supported on a fixed support set A. And then you investigate all polynomials in there, which um, admit basically a singularity, which admit a point where polynomial vanishes in all partial derivatives. And then you take the set of all these polynomials in the space and take the risky closure of this. So in general, this is a hypersurface and it's known, it's very nice. It has a lot of nice algebraic properties in particular, uh, unless it is like somewhat defective. Uh, there is a integral defining polynomial and this polynomial is the A discriminant. It's also an irreducible variety. And uh, in general, this polynomial is uh, very hard to describe, but it's known uh, in the circuit case. And essentially, um, you will find this number in the description. And that's uh, not by accident. So here is another uh, relation. It is like it is known that, um, or if you think about it, this is not uh, not very hard to see that. Uh, somewhat, if you if you look at the algebraic boundary of the non-negativity cone, um, it it it's pretty obvious that a piece of this should be at least governed by the A discriminant. And uh, well, then if you think about it a little bit more carefully, well, actually uh, somewhat th the boundary needs to be contained in the A discriminant because you have a point, a, a collection of real polynomials where you have a point where you have a minimum and that's a zero. So it needs to be, a, the zero needs to be a singular point, right? And uh, so it should be contained in there. Um, but, now uh, is the question like, how does it translate to the circuit polynomial case? And here you can really make this explicit, but um, essentially what you see is that a circuit polynomial only has exactly one zero uh, or at most one zero on the positive orthand. And um, for this one, you can essentially compute explicitly the singular point. And if you um, then write down, um, yeah, so okay, that now it's the question whether you know something about A discriminants, but if you do, there is, uh, you, in order to describe them, there is, uh, they are related to something that's called the, the Gale dual of the support matrix. And in this case, this is just a vector. And if you write down this vector, uh, you see that up to a multiple again, this number is appearing there. Um, so essentially, I think really the, the takeaway is to say, um, if you take the defining uh, polynomial of the A discriminant in uh, the circuit case, essentially, uh, this number kind of defines the polynomial. And then there is more to say, like maybe let me add this, there is more to say in terms of the algebraic boundary of the song cone, 
which is also related to a structure which is kind of, if you want to, so in a certain sense, a generalization of an A discrete. Okay, great. Thank you, Timo. So Bernard has a question. Do you have nice dual hierarchies for SOC? Um, well, we recently did some work on um, the dual song cone. Um, and, but I would not say, so this is, I think, not the same as in terms of the classical dual approach, which I guess here is meant in terms of moments and, and, and SOS. And for this, I would not say that we have exactly something like this. I mean, this is, it would be, this is never exactly came clear to me whether you have, I mean, okay, obviously it's, it's, it's not moments, right? I mean, so that, that, that governs like, I guess somewhat sums of squares or like the, the, the nice theorems about moments that you have uh, governs nicely with SOS. And here, I don't exactly know what would be the right approach to do it for song. Um, so I think the short answer really is, is no, except for this dual song cone works that we recently did. Okay, so the last question before we start the informal Q&A, uh, is the hypercube special in your final negative, res negative result or can it be replaced by any reasonable family of zero dimensional varieties varying with That's, N? And this yes. is from Jan. Okay, great. Uh, that's actually it's a very nice question. Um, I don't know. Um, I can say in a moment a little bit why the hypercube is special, in fact. Um, the, the general question is open, right? I mean, yeah, let's say, I mean, even, even for, for general ideals, you might say, well, I mean, how would different hierarchies perform there if they are meaningful in one or the other way? So the way how it is special, really, um, if you um, look at the Boolean hypercube is, if you think about it algebraically, you have, I mean, depending on whether you're on the zero one hypercube or the, maybe it's even easier to look at the minus one one uh, hypercube, um, you, would, you would define an ideal given by these kind of polynomial inequalities, right? And then you would reduce. And so what you see in this case is essentially you always have multilinear polynomials left in the coordinate ring that you look at. And if you think about combinatorially, really what, what is left, you see that if, you, if I had a general polynomial uh, with a general arbitrary degree, maybe sparse, then combinatorially I have a lot of ways to express myself in a way to build circuits on that. And that's kind of like the, the way why these certificates become useful. But if I just have these multilinear polynomials, all the circuits vanish, right? It, it, it all collapses. And uh, there, there's a very few ways to, to build meaningful uh, circuits on, on these multilinear polynomials. And so everything kind of, after this reduction, all the nice combinatorics and underlying properties that come with it vanishes. And okay. so, so I think we'll this is- maybe we'll have to take a, yeah. a final sentence, Timo, and then maybe we we'll can break for sure. the informal discussion. Um, but yeah, okay, so let's- uh, Yeah, I, I think this is the takeaway. I mean, like depending on what, what the combinatorics do, uh, it, it might generalize this. Right, fantastic. So let's thank Timo again for a wonderful talk. And we'll start our informal discussion and pause the recording. Mm -hmm.